Ban Dao is one of the most original Hmong arts. It's been passed on since the beginning of Hmong people. I feel like whenever I pick up Ban Dao and really work with the needle and the thread, like it reconnects me to a part of myself. It's a way of me remembering who I am and where my heritage comes from. So for me, it's a very emotional and very spiritual like connection to the art. A lot of my learning came from my mother. When you do this Hmong needlework embroidery, the traditional Hmong bandao, it's not like in a book where you can find it. And so I was looking for a teacher. Finding Suzanne Tao was like finding gold. She's very patient. And this skill takes a lot of patience. You have to stitch this way so that it goes in the right direction or so that your back will look pretty. She explains a lot about the colors, certain colors you can and cannot use if you're doing a certain piece. She talks about the different symbols. Some of it are geometric, some are like flowers or imitate animals. But there's always a meaning behind these. Some of the Hmong people live in the jungle of northern part of Laos. So many of the designs reflect uh, many of the animals and plants within the jungle. If you look at this piece here, you see the snails. The spirals represent the Milky Way. You also see the elephant foot designs. The country of Laos is known as the land of a million elephants. You also have the tiger face, the chicken crown, which is on the baby's hat. The intricate designs here reflect the Hmong writing system. We used to have our own writing system, but it was lost. A lot of folk tales and stories talks about the fact that they sew the alphabet into the clothing. In fact, the word for education in the Hmong language is meaning that if you want to uh, gain knowledge, go learn the embroidery. The elder generation has the stories and the knowledge and the history all in their minds. And if we don't connect with them and if we don't begin asking for it, then it's going to be lost. What we have here are materials that would be used on a traditional Hmong clothing, especially worn during the New Year. You can see these are in pieces, and so they would be sewn onto a shirt, for example. And then over here is Hmong clothing that has the coins on it. You'll hear that sound during the Hmong New Year as people are walking around. Pandao is passed on orally, usually from a mother or an auntie or a grandmother to the child. We started a program called Project Pandao to begin that intergenerational sharing of knowledge, that act of Crafting together, making bandao together, is that relationship building for the women in the family. Bandao making, it was really a skill that helped a young woman move through life, through finding her purpose in the family. It's carried on to some point, but I think with the war, there was a huge disruption to that. In the secret war of Laos, the Americans, instead of sending troops in, they sent CIA advisors. They recruited the Hmong people to serve as surrogate soldiers of the Vietnam War. After the United States pulled out of Vietnam, the communist government took over the country of Laos. Long Cheng was the CIA headquarter. Three planes were sent to evacuate the Hmong out of Long Cheng. 1,600 of them made it out. The rest of them had to find their way uh, over to Thailand, crossing the Mekong River. 
Bang Vinai was the largest refugee camp in Thailand. Over 40,000 people lived in Bang Vinai refugee camp, predominantly Hmong. So many of the Hmong in the United States came from Bang Vinai. Story cloths are Hmong experiences embroidered on a piece of textile. Story cloths came out at the refugee camps. In the cloth, you might see Hmong characters, but also soldiers, you know, red string that represents blood. The Hmong women and men who created these story cloths were sharing their stories through these pictorials. Some are folk tales, some are about life in the village. Some are about the New Year, and then some are about the migration from China all the way to America. My family came here October 22nd of 1976. My father, he was a captain in the military. He came here and he worked as a janitor. We have about 85,000 Hmong in the state of Minnesota. Most of them are here in the seven county metro area. Here, you know, you have a culture of acceptance. I think the local community really wanted the Hmong to thrive. And I think that we've added to the vibrancy here in Minnesota. Here in Minnesota, one of the things that grows really well is root vegetables. So we're working with rutabagas, we're working kohlrabi, different kinds of turnips, stuff that traditionally probably most Hmong people wouldn't do back in Laos or Thailand. My mom always said to us, Vinai is not where our life ended, but it's actually where our life started. My parents met in Vinai and they married. I was born in 84 and then we were in there until 88 when we came to America. Oh, I'm like, thanks. dude, I, I love this guy. <laughs> so we're at Hmong Village, probably one of my favorite places to come to. When we first moved up here, we lived like 10 minutes away. Uh, you're the Shiku, you are Hmong um, style. Yeah. Lao style, that means that it has really that funkiness, that fermented pace in there. Uh, the Thai style is a little sweeter, and then the Hmong style is like kind of a mix of two. And that really is descriptive of Hmong food. The Hmong food is based on our people's ability to adapt to the cultures that are around them. And that is actually the history of our people, is being able to adapt to wherever we go. There's two cultures, and you take the beauty of both cultures, you create a third culture. I believe in forging. When you forge ideas from different cultures together, what you're doing is you're making a bond there. In that bond, what happens is there's growth. Hmong Minnesota was inspired by Hmong Bandao. I was trying to find a way to tell the story of the Hmong American experience. It came together as like a nice fusion of like digital art with like Hmong traditional story quilts. The top part is a lot of the experiences that I would hear from my parents, such as farming in the valley, being with their animals, and even with like my father being in the war, learning how to, you know, hold a rifle, things like that. And the bottom part is my Hmong American experience here in the Midwest. As I was leaving to go to college, my mom said she wanted to buy me a quilt. And at the time, I didn't see the significance of it. And it was more money than we could afford. And it's now very special to me. My father always talked about how we had to learn the culture so that it could live on. Because if somebody didn't do it, then it would die, and then there would be no more Hmong people. We are our practices, our traditions, and our culture. For my mom, it was more than just teaching Bandao. It was really like, how do I make sure that this beautiful art that's really, truly Hmong continues to live on through my students? <laughs> And to also see pieces that her mother has made, like this piece you're holding is over 70 years old. I feel like being able to show them that and share those stories is just very powerful. 
it's inspiring. It's a piece of us, you know, it's really made by Hmong hands through the art of Bandao.